The part of uh, Exodus 20 I want to look at is verse 25 where the Bible reads, And if thou wilt make me an altar, <clears throat> excuse me, and if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. And the title of my sermon this morning is this, Polluting Salvation with Works. Polluting Salvation with Works. And we have a, a lot of symbolism or pictures in the Old Testament that symbolize spiritual truths in the Bible. And what we understand here in Exodus chapter number 20 is God, whenever he's giving the commandments to the children of Israel, one is specific to sacrifice. One is specific here to making offerings unto the Lord. And God does not want the children of Israel to make an offering on top of a stone that's been graven by man's device, that's had a tool put upon it. This is reiterated and hammered in other places. Another verse here that's pretty interesting is verse 26. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now that's kind of a, diff a difficult verse, but if we, if we put all this in context of salvation, it kind of gives us a little bit of a, a new light to look at these things. The altar is really kind of that foundation. It's kind of that basis upon which your sacrifice and your offerings are going to be put. Okay, And at the end of the day, that rock or that stone is a picture of Jesus Christ. And when we think about the gospel, you know, we want to make sure that that gospel is not polluted with anything or altered or corrupted. And a lot of people pollute and corrupt salvation today with works. They add works to salvation. I'm going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that salvation is not of works. That could be another way to look at this sermon is I'm proving that salvation is not of works. But... By having a man grave something on that stone or carve it or shape it or put it in whatever he wants it to look at, now you've polluted that stone. It's no longer just what God created. It's also what man did, isn't it? It's also adding to what the man has done. And here's the thing, salvation's not of man, it's of God only. It's only what God has created. It's holy of God. Notice it says whole stone. Meaning what? It hasn't been chipped, it hasn't been scraped, it hasn't been carved, it hasn't been cut. Because typically, you know, the stones that people use to build with today, what do they do? They shape them into bricks, they shape them into blocks, they shape them into some kind of a, a stone that they use to build upon. But God's saying, for my altar, I just want you to put just whole stones down, you don't do anything to it, and that's where you sacrifice your offerings today. And this is a picture of of a salvation that has not been polluted, a salvation that has not been corrupted by man's works, by man's efforts, or anything he does. Think about steps. Wouldn't steps imply also, if there's steps to get to the altar, work? And here's the thing. If you want to be judged by your works, you know what? You're going to be standing naked before God and exposed, and guess what? He's going to judge you for your works. That's why he doesn't want steps upon the altar, because it's picturing, again, another spiritual picture of the fact that salvation's free, it's easy, it's simple. I mean, you just have the altar of earth, you just have the altar of stone, you just throw stones down there. I mean, it couldn't be simpler. By having steps, maybe you would limit certain people from being able to get to that altar. What about the lame? What about the maimed? What about the halt? What about these type of people that aren't able to get up to that altar? But here's the thing. God's altar is available for all. It's simple for all. It's easy for all. And here's the thing. We don't want to pollute salvation today by adding works. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 27. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 27. And what's interesting is the whole Bible teaches that salvation is by faith. That it's all of God. You know, some people are dispensational or dispensationalists, and they'll say, well, in the Old Testament, you were saved by works, but in the New Testament, you're saved by faith. That is wrong. You've only ever been saved by faith. And we don't want to pollute salvation. We don't want to pollute the gospel. It was always a stone that just God built, that God created. It has nothing to do with us. Look at Deuteronomy 27, verse 5. And there, and there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. And thou shalt offer peace offerings, and shalt eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. So again, it's reiterated that what? That you're not going to lift up any tool upon it, that it's just going to be what God created. It's holy of God. Now go if you would to Ephesians chapter number 2. Go to Ephesians chapter number 2. 
I'll read for you from Mark. The Bible says, And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Now what's interesting is that Jesus Christ, when preaching against the Jews, preaching against the Pharisees, he explained that he was, they were going to reject a particular stone. They, were, they didn't want anything to do with this particular stone. But here's the thing. It was the chief cornerstone. It was the head of the corner, which means it's what? It's the first stone being laid. Now, if you reject the first stone being laid, you're also going to reject everything that comes after that as well. But here's the thing. The Jews weren't even on stage one. They weren't even saved. They rejected the Messiah. They weren't even saved. When Jesus Christ is con uh, confronted with Nicodemus in the evening, he says, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? I mean, he's just confounded how the smartest people in their land, the ones that have studied the Bible the most, they're not even saved yet. They're not even on step one yet. And really, it's no different in the world we live in today. The masters of Israel, the masters of Christianity, the masters of divinity, they're not even saved. They don't, they're not even on stage one of salvation is by faith today. And you know what? We need to keep laying this foundation, that head of the corner today. We need to be the champions today to say salvation is not of works. And we're not going to pollute it. We're not going to let anything corrupt it. We're not going to lift up any tool upon it. And I'm telling you, in Christianity today, there's a lot of people lifting up tools on those stones. The stone of salvation. And that stone is a picture of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Now, I want to back up one verse. Let's get a little more context. Now, therefore, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner, notice this word, stone, and whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, and whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Notice Jesus Christ is described as that stone. But here's the thing. A lot of people take that stone of Jesus Christ the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, you know what they do? They lift up their tool upon it and they start carving it and they start engraving it and they start shaping it to how they want it to look. But here's the thing. Either you have the whole stone of Jesus Christ or you're not saved. Either you don't lift up any tool upon it or you're not saved. Because the reality is salvation is only of faith. There is no work. There is no engraving. There's no shaping. There's no any of that. God will refuse your altar if it has been carved. He doesn't want that type of an altar. He wants an altar that's just holy of him. Think about it. You can't make a stone. Stones are what God made. But we could corrupt it. We could pollute it, right? We could change it. We could alter it. And here's the thing. The gospel's not of man. It's not what man did. It has nothing to do with us. Jesus Christ and God did it all. And therefore, we don't want to use our graving tools. We don't want to lift any kind of iron tool upon it. No, it's just not of works. Now, I wish there was a chapter. Oh, yeah, there is. We're in chapter two, right? Look at verse number eight. Maybe there's a chapter that says that salvation is not of works. Wouldn't that be nice if the Bible just told you plainly, like whether or not salvation was of works or not? Well, let's read. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the Bible plainly states salvation is not of works. It's not even a, a difficult subject to prove. The reason why a lot of people reject it, though, today is because of pride. Now, let's keep with our analogy, though. Let's think about this altar. Let's say I have an altar where I literally just took a bunch of stones and just threw them together, and then you have an altar where you shaped it, and you carved it, and you put hours and energy, and you built this beautiful, you know, co column, or you built this beautiful uh, statue, or whatever. And essentially, whenever we perform our offerings, God likes your altar better. Wouldn't you then be able to brag about the fact that it's like, well, of course he likes mine. Look how much effort I put into it. Look how much energy, and look at how I shaped these stones, and look how I built them together. That's the same with this picture here in Ephesians chapter number two saying, look, if you going to heaven has anything to do with your works, then you could brag about it. Then you could boast about it. But if you say, hey, 
just grab some stones like I did and just throw them down. There's no boasting in that. There's no bragging in the stone. Look, a stone's a stone. A rock is a rock. And here's the thing. The gospel is a gift that's just given of God. He gets all the honor. He gets all the glory. He gets all the recognition for salvation. And as soon as you start shaping that rock to look like something different than what God made, it's no longer going to be accepted with God. God doesn't like your carved altar. He doesn't like your rock that's been shaped the way you want. Go to John chapter number one. Go to John chapter number one. And I'm kind of laying a foundation for this sermon this morning, but the Bible makes it clear that salvation's not of works, yet there's so many uh, denominations, there's so many churches, there's so many pastors, there's so many preachers, there's so many people today that are literally polluting salvation with works. They're polluting the gospel with works. They're trying to add some kind of works. They just want to shape it a little bit. They just want to you know, grave it a little bit, or they just want to uh, square it off a little bit. Well, these stones, they don't fit together as well as like, I would like. So let's just make them into bricks or you know, whatever it is that they want. Or let's tongue and groove these rocks or these stones so that they kind of shape together and they fit together better. Look, that's using your own reasoning and logic. But the Bible makes it clear, salvation's not of man. Look what it says in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, this is talking about Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, the word even means specifically. So if you're going to define what it means to receive him, specifically it means those that believe on his name. Okay? So the people that believe on Jesus Christ, they're the ones that received him, and they do what? They become a child of God. Notice that you're not automatically a child of God. You have to become a child of God through what? Through faith. We're all children of God by faith is what the Bible teaches. Look at the next verse though. Which were born, and it says very clearly, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, let's break these things down for a second. Not of blood, what does that mean? That means that Jews are not automatically saved. That means it doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter if you're black, red, yellow, white. They're all precious in his sight. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It has nothing to do with physical DNA. It's nothing physical. It, again, salvation is not of us. It says in the next phrase, nor the will of the flesh. Now this, you know, to me would be the things that you're doing or not doing, right? Right? I mean, the will of the flesh, you know, subduing that flesh or giving up sin or stopping sinning or uh, trying really hard to serve the Lord or whatever it is that you're doing in your flesh, the things that you're capable of doing, notice your salvation's not of that. It's not about what you're doing or what you're not doing. It even says in the next verse, well, some people say, of course, we're all sinners and we're not going to be perfect, but you have to desire it. You know, you have to want to. But look at the next phrase, nor the will of man. It's not even the desire to not do things or the desire to do things. You know, some people say you have to be you have to be willing to give up your sin to be saved. No, it says it's not the will of man. It's not the will of. Well, you have to desire to want to serve God. No. It's just it's just not any of that. It's just of God. It's just a whole stone. You just accept it by faith. It's just a you receive it. It's not about what you're doing. It's not about what you can do. It's not about what you will do. You just receive it. You just take the rock and you just, hey, this is my altar. That's it. It's that simple. It's that easy. Yet so many people want to pollute it with all three of these, don't they? They want to pollute it by saying, well, you have to be a certain ethnicity or you have to be a certain race. You say, who would be like that? I don't know, the black Hebrew Israelites. They look at a white person and say, you can't be saved. Or vice versa. There's, there's probably white Baptist brighters or some racist group, Ku Klux Klan or something. I don't know. Peter Ruckman or something. He said the only reason he didn't join the KKK is because they were against the Jews. So, But here's the thing. There's probably some racist group that says because you're dark, you can't get in. Oh, yeah, the Mormons. I mean, there's always going to be groups that say, well, it's based on your blood. That's polluting it. That's polluting salvation. Or they'll say, well, you have to repent of your sin to get saved, don't they? 
They say, oh, you have to give up something. You have to subdue that will of your flesh. You have to give something up. That's polluting salvation. Or they get even more tricky. You have to want to give it up. No one's going to give it up, but you have to want it. You know, and if you don't really want it, then you're not really saved. You need to get saved again. And you have people sitting there thinking like, I believe in Jesus, but I kind of want to sin. What do I have to do? And it's confusing to them. It would be confusing to them if I said, hey, you have to uh, take these stones and you have to carve them so that God will be pleased on, onto what you make. And you say, what am I supposed to carve it like? I don't know. Well, how, what tool should I use? I don't know. But if you don't use one, you're not saved. You know, you're not going to get your, he's not going to like your, it, that's what they get up and teach all day long. They teach you have to use this tool or you have to want to use this tool or you have to shape it right. And you're just like, how do I do it? And they're like, no one knows. That's confusing. Salvation's not confusing. It's very simple. Go to Romans chapter three. Romans makes it real clear. In fact, it's so clear that if you don't get it, it's because you're spiritually blinded. And really, that's the, the thing we have to understand is that salvation is so simple, it's so easy that you're either spiritually blinded, it's a spiritual problem if you don't get it. Because it's just so straightforward from the scriptures. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even, meaning specifically, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, what it, there is no difference, that helps confirm the fact that it was not a blood, is it? It wasn't Jew or Gentile. It's just, hey, whoever believes is saved. And notice this is called the righteousness of God, because that's what it is that saves us. It's the righteousness of God that saves us, not my righteousness, not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of God, and we get it by faith of Jesus Christ. And notice it's all that believe. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice salvation is freely given. It's freely accept, accepted. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past the forbearance of God. You say, well, why are you saved, Pastor Shelley? Because of his righteousness. Hey, when you go out and you preach the gospel, what do you preach? His righteousness. Hey, what is your church here to honor and glorify? His righteousness. It's not about my righteousness. I don't have righteousness. It already told us in verse 23 that for, or, for all sin, that's me. That's you. That's every, we're the sinner group. The righteousness group is God. That's it. And if you want to be righteous... You get his righteousness. That's how we get the forgiveness of sins. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. No, what are we declaring here? When we go to and we preach the gospel, what are we declaring? His righteousness. And it says that he might be just. Who? God, Christ, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The only way I get justified is by believing in Jesus. That's it. So you'd say, well, verse 26, where is boasting then? It's almost like you just thought of every question. You know, it's just like, you're like, it just, you follow this logically, it just fits in perfect. You say, well, if, if all it is is what Jesus did, then where can I boast? Where can I brag? It's excluded. There is none. Just like if you grab a bunch of stones and make an altar, and he grabs a bunch of stones and makes an altar, it's like, well, where's the bragging? It's excluded. You can't. Because you can't look at the stone and be like, well, I, spe I grave these one real special. I put my name on it, you know, or I shaped it this way, or I did this. No, it's just, it's so all of him. It says it is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Verse 28, I love this verse. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Salvation is just not of the deeds of the law. It's not of works. The Bible couldn't be clearer. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Here's the thing. If your works has anything to do with getting you saved, now God owes you something. 
Just like that altar. If you build that altar special, now God kind of owes you something because of the work you put into the altar. But here's the thing. If you just take all the stones that he already provided you with, it's not a debt. He gave it to you. Just like salvation is just given to you. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not. Doesn't that sound like someone that's not lifting up their tool upon the stone? Someone that's not doing any work, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Notice, you could literally have zero works and be saved. Just like your altar can have zero work done to it, and God still accepts your altar. That's how simple salvation is. That's how clear salvation is. That's how easy it is. Verse 6, even meaning specifically, as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness, I love this phrase, without works. You say, Pastor Shirley, I feel like we're getting a theme here. Yeah. The Bible just hammers, no works, not of works, without works. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It has nothing to do with what you do and everything to do with what he did. That's it. And we don't want to pollute it by adding something that we did or what we do or what we will do or what we could do or what we want to do. No, it's just all what he did. That's it. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know how I have peace with God? Jesus. Faith in what he did. Look at verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. The book of Romans just hammers this. The free gift. How can you argue with the free gift? It's just... It's not anything that you do. Now, obviously, our world today, they trick you and they say, hey, come in and we'll, you know, we'll give you a free lunch. And in the lower print, it's like if you buy 20. It's like, that's not a free gift. That's a gimmick. Okay? People are saying that free, free, free. Here's the thing. Even Santa Claus rips this off and, and distorts it and pollutes it. Because you don't get gifts from Santa for free. You have to be good to get it, don't you? Otherwise, you get a lump of coal. Here's the thing. That's not the gospel. The gospel isn't be good and get something. It's free. It's the only thing that's really free in this world. All you do is just believe in Jesus Christ and he gives it unto you. Now, it wasn't free to Jesus. It wasn't free to God. God the Father paid the ultimate price by sacrificing his son. The son paid the ultimate price by coming here and and sacrificing himself and going through all the pain and the sufferings and the evil that he had to go through and being rejected of his own father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hey, it wasn't free for them, but it's too bad for you because it's too expensive for you. You don't have a gift to offer like that. Your stones aren't going to be as good as the ones that God has. Therefore, you either take his altar or you're not saved. That's it. Look at chapter 10. Look at chapter 10. Just flip over. And look, I, I, now I get why it's the Romans' road, don't you? I mean, it's just like faith, 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 free gift, free gift, free gift, free, free, free. And then you get to chapter 10, it's just like, all right. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Look, the Jews didn't get saved. They didn't want to get saved because you know what? They want to carve those stones. They want to create their own righteousness. They want to create their own altar. They want to pollute it. And so instead of just accepting and submitting themselves to what God has provided for them, they have to provide it for themselves. And it comes from a heart of pride. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Hey, you say, do I have to get saved by following the law? No, it's ended by believing in Jesus Christ. You say, well, what commandments do I also have to fulfill? It's ended. It's done. The end of the law for righteousness. There is no law that I have to keep to be righteous. As soon as I believe in Jesus Christ, righteous. And you say, well, what other law do you have to keep? None. Zero. It's done. That's why the Bible says saved with a D at the end. It doesn't say being saved or could be saved or might be saved. It's just saved. Done. I am saved. Look at verse 9. Say, how does that work? Well, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
Look, it's done. As soon as you confess and believe in your heart, it's done. Just like that altar. All you have to do is just throw the rocks, you're done. Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever, meaning anyone, whosoever believeth on him, notice this, shall not be ashamed. Now, ashamed there would be in the context of the fact that when you stand before God and you're going to be judged, if you were standing there naked, wouldn't you be kind of ashamed? But here's the thing, you're not going to be standing there naked. You're going to be standing there clothed with Jesus Christ's righteousness. So you're not going to be ashamed. But here's the thing, without his robe, you're going to stand before him naked and you're going to be ashamed, just like Adam and Eve were in the garden. And what did they do to try and cover it? Their works, their fig leaves, the things that they did. But here's the thing, you, you can't make the garment that's going to cover your sin. It's either you take Jesus Christ's garment or it's nothing. That's why you don't mix woolen and linen. There's other things that we could look at in the pictures here. But in the context of our stone, hey, if God's looking at your altar and your altar's got some graving on it, you're not getting in. He's not going to accept that type of an altar. You either have a, a, a whole stone offering or it's nothing. And if you believe in him, notice you won't be ashamed. No one who believed in Jesus will be ashamed. It doesn't say like, well, some people believed, but then they screwed up later and they're going to be ashamed. No, whosoever believed in him shall not be ashamed. You say, well, I'm nervous about standing before God. Well, if you believed in him, you don't have to be nervous because none of you will be ashamed. You'll be clothed with his righteousness. It's perfect. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he gives us a recipe. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So notice the way people get saved is they call upon the name of the Lord, but specifically they have to have that faith. Did it mention here from 13 to 15 on how to get people saved anything about them turning from their sins? Repenting of their sins, living a righteous life, anything. It's just, did you call on the Lord in faith or did you not? And notice we go out and we preach glad tidings. Isn't that good news? When you walk up to people and say, I have a free gift for you. Rather than saying, I have a bunch of work for you. <laughs> and if you don't do all this work perfect, you're going to hell for all of eternity. That's not glad tidings. That's a message of condemnation. That's the law. Isn't that the law? Think about the law. What does the law say? Follow all this perfectly or go to hell. That's not glad tidings. You know what's glad tidings is saying, just believe in what Jesus did for you and you go to heaven. You say, well, what if, what if I don't live right? You still go to heaven. What if I screw up? You still go to heaven. What if, it doesn't matter, you're still going to heaven. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. It was never of works. It never will be of works. And if you go out and preach works, you're a messenger of condemnation, not a messenger of hope. The only hope we have is in Jesus Christ. And we don't want to pollute the gospel with works today. We want to be a clear preacher of the gospel, preaching it by faith alone. That's it. Nothing else. But there's so many Christians today in this world. And you know what they're doing? They're offering sacrifices on a polluted altar. But here's the thing. Because they have the wrong altar, God's never going to be pleased with them or any of their sacrifices. You can go down. There's going to be, there's probably a million people in this area in a church this morning. At least hundreds of thousands. I mean, this is the Bible Belt, you know? Actually, it's nice driving on Sunday mornings because nobody's on the road, right? But there's still probably a lot of people in a church on the weekend, aren't there? Millions in this area. And here's the thing. A lot of them are performing sacrifices. They're going to church. They're giving money. They're giving time. They're giving effort. They're giving energy. They're doing all these things. But here's a problem. Their altar is the wrong altar. They're offering sacrifices on a hewn stone altar rather than the whole stone altar of the gospel by faith. And here's the thing. God will have no respect to those sacrifices. Just like God did not respect Cain's sacrifice, God did not respect Cain's offering, anybody that has the wrong altar will not be accepted with God. And it's frustrating because 
when you try to talk to people about salvation, what do they bring up? Their sacrifices. But we're trying to talk about, to them about their altar. Saying, oh, okay, great. That's wonderful about all your sacrifice. Let's talk about your altar for a moment. Let's talk about what your altar looks like. And here's the thing. Their altar is a faith plus works altar. And I, and I have two pollutions that I really want to talk about this morning. Number one is a faith and work salvation. Now go over to Romans 11. We're right there. You don't even turn the page. But when I go out and I talk to people, almost every single time I ask them, is salvation faith alone or faith plus works? And they almost all just say faith plus works. I mean, I don't even have to be tricky. I don't have to be tricky. I'm not up there with like some cool, smooth transition or I'm not doing anything cool. I'm just like, hey, how's it going? Do you believe salvation is by faith alone or faith plus works? And they're just like faith plus works, both. That's what they say. I don't even have to, I don't even have to like try and ask them all these clever questions or whatever. I'm just like, hey, is it both or is it just faith? And you know what they tell me? It's both. But isn't that an altar where they've graved upon it? Isn't that a stone that they've modified and they've chipped and they've changed? And here's the thing. If you do that, you completely ruin salvation. And in their mind, they're thinking, well, there's no problem in adding extra. You know, it's like, can I get extra pickles on my burger? They're like, well, there's nothing wrong with extra pickles, you know. They think it's like, well, if I, all I have to do is faith, you know, to be saved, then there's no problem in adding some extra. It's like, mom and dad, if you add cheese to the broccoli, I'm still eating the broccoli. You know, they're thinking like, as, I, as long as I get the job done, right? So in the mind of Catholics, in the mind of Protestants, in the mind of many Baptists today, they think it's a faith plus work salvation. But here's the thing. If that's your altar, you're just not even saved. You cannot, it's not, it's not adding to or, or doing better. Look, that's changing the shape of the rock. That's changing what your altar looks like. And the Bible makes it clear here. Romans chapter 11, look at verse number 5. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, here's the context. Look at verse 1 for a moment. It says, I say then, hath God cast away his people. So, Paul's going to now explain, is God done with the nation of Israel? Is God done with every single Israelite or every Jew or, or those that were the physical descendants of Abraham? And the reality is, it says in the next statement, God forbid. No, God is not done with every physical descendant of the nation of Israel. But the majority of them he is. That's why it says in verse number five, even so at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the lecture. What is remnant? Remnant means a small leftover group, a faction, a minuscule amount. It's just some kind of residual, a smaller portion. So he's saying only a little bit. Only a remnant, only a small group of Israelites has he not cast away. Now, why were they not cast away? Is it because of their physical heritage? No. He says, by grace, according to the election of grace. Election means choosing. God chose those Israelites to still use because of grace. Now, what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. It's something that you don't deserve, I don't deserve. It makes it really clear in verse 6. It says, and if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So some people get confused. They're like, well, why can't it be both? Because these are two contradictory items. You can't have both. It's either grace or it's work. But it can't be both. Otherwise, you destroy the definition of both words. What is grace? Grace is no work. What is work? No grace. So here's the thing. You can't have both. You can't say, well, this is what a lot of people say. Well, God gives us the grace to do the works. And it's like... Bleh, 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 bleh. That would be like me saying, I have something really free for you, but it's going to cost. But I'm freely giving you the work to do to, to get it for free. If I said, hey, I have something free for I want to give you my Bible completely free, but you have to give me $100. Are both of those statements true? If it's free, then you don't have to give me money. If you have to give me money, then it's not free. You can't have both. If I said, well, I am giving you so much freedom to buy this from me that it's free. 
That's what they basically do. God's giving you so much grace to do the works. Well, then it's no more grace. Just like if you took a stone and you did no work to it, then it's a whole stone. But as soon as you grave it, it can't be both. It's no longer whole. It's now carved. It's now graven. It's now been shaped. Both cannot be true. So as soon as you add works to salvation, as soon as you add works to grace, it ceases to be grace. It ceases to be free. It ceases to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot have both. Now, people will bring up certain verses. I'm going to go to probably, in my mind, the most common uh, verse section where people will argue on this topic. Go to James chapter 2. Go to James chapter number 2. Now, for me, this is pretty much number 1, 2, 3, and 4 of, of arguments against what I'm teaching here at the door. If I'm talking to somebody, there's other places in the Bible that some people twist, but your common, normal person, the only really verse they can think of or they usually go to to prove work salvations is James 2. They'll say, well, yeah, but what about faith without works? Isn't it dead? It's like, yeah, that verse is in the Bible, sure. It doesn't say exactly that, but basically it's saying that in essence if we were going to get a verbatim quote. But here's the thing. I can, pr- I can prove salvation is by faith alone in James 2 just as well. James 2 also teaches that salvation is by faith alone. Okay? Now, look at verse number 17. This is the verse that they're thinking of in their mind. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now, let's keep with our analogy, because I I believe when we use the pictures of the Bible, it helps us understand everything so well, okay? Here's the thing. This is basically what they're they're asking. If I have an altar of whole stones, but I never do any sacrifices on it, okay, what, what is the benefit of that altar, essentially, okay? Now, here's the thing. From a humanistic perspective and being pleasing to God... It's not going to go all the way and please him to the fullest extent because he wanted you to build that altar to go ahead and put burnt offerings on, right? Isn't that the whole point of making the altar is then to go ahead and put sacrifices and put offerings on? But then the question is, well, what if we only have that altar, though? And we're talking and bringing it into the spiritual picture of salvation. It is alone. No one's going to argue that it's not alone. Well, okay, let's read a little bit and see what it says. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, what is he talking about? Is he talking about the altar itself or is he talking about the sacrifice he's putting on the altar? Talking about a sacrifice he's putting on the altar, right? Verse 22, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and... He was called the friend of God. Now, here's the thing. Let's slow down and unpack verse 23. What does verse 23 say? It says that Abraham believed God, and then notice, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So what did that just tell us you have to do to get imputed righteousness? Believe. What's the problem with James 2? James 2 said that all you have to do is believe and you're saved. Hey, that is exactly what it says in Romans chapter number four, that Abraham believed God was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's the exact same thing. But it says something also. It says, and, and he was called the friend of God. Then it says in verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now here's the thing. If I have a whole stone altar, okay, and I never sacrifice on there, will God be pleased at the fullest extent, no, because he wants me to also do my burnt offerings, my peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. He wants me to do those things. And a picture of Abraham is offering his son, Isaac, upon that altar, okay? And that would be an, an, a picture of, you know, you bringing your sacrifice, bring, doing the things that you do in order to serve the Lord. So here's the thing. Is it very profitable for me to build an altar and never sacrifice? No, it'd be profitable for me to build that altar and then also sacrifice on top of that. And then God will be pleased with those sacrifices. So here's the thing. James 2 is showing you that by getting saved, God is not going to just be pleased with you no matter what. There's something more than just being saved in life. You know what's another thing that'd be cool? Being called the friend of God. 
And here's the thing, you can be saved and not the friend of God. Jesus Christ said, if you're my friend, you would do the things that I say. If you're my friend, keep my commandments. I mean, you could just go all over the Bible and make it clear. Hey, you want to be God's friend? You also have to do things that are right and pleasing unto him, just like all of your friends. Are you friends with people that don't do any? They never call me. They never talk to me. They're never nice. They never do anything I say, but they're my buddy. It's like, that's kind of a weird buddy, right? Wouldn't your buddy be someone you talk to, you hang out with, they do good things unto you? The same with God. You want to be God's friend, what are you going to do? Hang out with him, called reading the Bible, talk to him, called praying, going to church, being around him, where two or three are gathered together, uh, there in my name, there am I in the midst. I mean, it makes sense that you need also works in order to be pleasing unto God, but here's the thing. What if I didn't have any of those works? We already read the Bible says I'm saved without works. We already proved that beyond a shadow of doubt. Even James 2 itself says that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. But then it says also, and he was called the friend of God. Why is Abraham called the friend of God? Because he wasn't just saved, he also was following God's commandments. He was also willing to sacrifice things unto the Lord. And then it says in verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. In what way is Abraham being justified? He's being justified by being called the friend of God. Because you can't be called the friend of God if you're not putting on the, the, the sacrifices. But here's the thing. If you have a hewn stone altar, it doesn't matter how many sacrifices you're putting on there. You're not saved or the friend of God. You're neither. That's why you have to have the right altar. It's important to talk about what the altar looks like. And this is what a lot of people will say. Well, if you don't have works, then you're not saved. Okay, they say if you don't have any works, then you don't have, then you're not saved. But here's the thing: salvation wasn't about the sacrifices we were putting on there; it was about the stones. Can I have no sacrifices and still have an altar stone, a whole stone offering? Basically, basically, I build an altar and it's just of whole stones that can exist without sacrifices. Therefore, I ignore all the sacrifices, I ignore all your works, and I'm looking at what kind of altar you have. That's what's going to determine if you're saved or not. Not how many sacrifices you put on there. Not what kind of sacrifices you put on there. Look, there are some people that have no works. They just have that altar. And guess what? They're going to make it in just by that altar alone. Just by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. But doesn't it bring to life, verse 17, even so faith that it hath not works is dead being alone? It's like, well, this is kind of an unprofitable altar you got here, buddy. Why don't you go ahead and sacrifice something? Why don't you actually do something for the Lord, Jesus Christ? And obviously we should. Obviously that's the whole point. Obviously that's what God's commanding us and instructing us and giving us all these reasons to do it. But here's the thing. If you have the wrong altar, everything else is meaningless. Quit telling me about what sacrifices you're putting on the altar. Let's just talk about your altar. They want to point to all the sacrifices. Well, but I go to church and I fast and I give money and I tithe. And I... Okay, great. But what altar do you have? Did you, did you carve your altar up? Is your altar just of faith? Because here's the thing. They want to point to the sacrifices they're putting on the altar rather than the altar that they have. And that's why we go out and we try to convince people to have the right altar. Don't have any hewn stones in your altar or you're not saved. Now go to Jonah chapter number two, Jonah chapter number two. The Bible's so clear, it's so easy to prove to somebody that salvation is just by faith alone. And I love going to Romans. I love showing a lot of those verses. If someone brings up James 2, I'll sometimes just point out 23 and say, well, it says Abraham believed God and was imputed unto righteousness. And then go back to Romans 4 and say the exact, show them the exact same thing and say, what's wrong here? And then say, yeah, obviously God wants us to also have works and be his friend and for him to be pleased with us. But here's the thing, it has nothing to do with that. Either you believe only in him, either it's all what he did, or you're just not saved. It's that clear, it's that simple. James 2 is not uh, an epistle written to even get you saved. It would be silly to try and use that as your proof text for salvation when the whole point's not trying to get people saved, it's trying to encourage people to have works. So if you have an entire epistle written on encouraging you to works, I wonder why false prophets and false teachers love to go there to prove to you how to get saved. What do they love? Hebrews, James. They love to go all to the chapters of the Bible that are proving the importance of works to try and conflate it with salvation. But here's the thing. Why don't we go to passages like John 3, 
which is like Jesus trying to tell people how to get saved, or go to the book of Romans, which is telling you how to get people saved, that's going to be the best doctrine on salvation, is that when the context is about getting saved, being saved, what it looks like to be saved, all the doctrines about salvation. Now, here's another thing that people pollute salvation with is this, repenting of your sins. Now, Jonah chapter number two is going to give us some insight because here's the problem with this doctrine. The, probably the biggest problem is that phrase is never even found in your Bible. Now, this is bizarre because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how can I truly believe that something that's necessary for my salvation is never said even one time in the Bible? Wouldn't that be kind of scary? What does it take to get saved if this doesn't even have a single time mentioning what you have to do to be saved? You need a guru. You need a cult leader to come around and tell you, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but let me tell you how to get saved. No, 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 no. It's either in here or it's not true. God didn't leave out the most important thing, the most principal thing, the most foundational thing is getting saved, but there's a really important step that I didn't include. It's like everything you got from China, parts not included. It's like, well, I would have enjoyed this product, but they didn't give me the batteries or they didn't give me, you know, the screws or the bolts or whatever it is that I need. It's like, that's not God. God all the parts are included. And in fact, they're like, you have extra. I don't even need all the salvation verses that he gave me necessarily to get saved. It's extra. I mean, I have so many to get saved from. Now, obviously, I need every single verse, but I'm saying just for salvation, I wouldn't have to show you every verse on salvation to get saved. That would take a really long time. You just need some. You just need a few. You just need one. Just John 3, 16 is enough to get someone saved. Now, but this philosophy, repenting of your sins or turning from sins, you can find this concept in the Bible. And the Bible does teach that we should try to turn away from sin, that we should give up sin, that we should stop sinning, that we should repent of sin. But here's the thing, that context is never in context of salvation. And the Bible makes it clear it works. Look at Jonah chapter, uh, I meant to say three, I said two. But look at Jonah chapter three, look at verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Now, this is a great verse for so many reasons, but number one is it's explaining if you turn from sin, if you stop sinning, if you're going a different direction in your life, you know, I was a drinker, I was going to the bar, and then all of a sudden I gave up drinking. I was a smoker, I smoked 12 packs a day, and then I gave up smoking. I was a liar and a thief and a blasphemer and a persecutor, and then I gave that up. When God looks at someone doing that, he says it's something very specific, works. But I thought we already read in the Bible, salvation's not of works. You know why? Because it has nothing to do with giving up a sinful lifestyle. Because if you were honest with yourself, you would realize you have to give up a sinful lifestyle until you die. We haven't arrived. You have to die daily. You have to crucify the flesh daily. And in fact, anybody that thinks they've given up sin is only deceiving themselves. I could, you know, even being a pastor of a Baptist church, I guarantee I can't convince anybody that I've never sinned or I'm not sinning. You going to this church, you try to, I don't sin anymore. No one will believe you. You could scream it, you could yell it, you could make a shirt about it. It doesn't matter. No one will ever believe you. The only person that could believe you is yourself. You can only trick yourself. That's why salvation's not of repenting. And here's the thing, well, maybe it's repenting of the big sins. Well, unfortunately, lying will get you into hell too. Unfortunately, any sin will get you into hell. So if you're going to give up the big sins, let's throw the little ones in there too, like the thought of foolishness. Good luck on that one. Not looking at things that are sinful. Good luck on that one. Welcome to America. I mean, you're going to have to have a hijab without the eyes opening. You're just going to have to. And then, guess what? You can't even imagine something sinful. Good luck on that one. You might as well just get all the government recommended uh, vaccinations and then maybe you won't think right. You can't stop. You can't stop it. You're a sin machine. You're going to keep sinning. That's why you have to keep trying and working at it. It's hard work. 
It's so much effort, and you'll never, ever make it there. That's why salvation has nothing to do with it. But you say, well, repentance always means turning from sin. Well, doesn't it say in the same verse that God repented of the evil? Does that mean that God turned from evil? Like wickedness, like sin? Well, here's the thing. Evil can mean one of two things. Evil can mean sin or something that's sinful, or it could mean harm. What was God going to do to Nineveh? Destroy it. So what's the evil mean here? Harm. So what did God repent of? He didn't repent of sin. He has no sin to repent of. He couldn't repent if he wanted to because there's no sin to repent of. What did he do? He decided not to destroy them. Why? Because they hearkened to the message. They got right with God and he was merciful and long-suffering and gracious to them. So he decided not to destroy them. That's what we call a change of mind. And here's the thing. When it comes to salvation, which type of repentance do we need? Do we need to turn from our sin or do we need to change our mind? We need to change our mind. And stop thinking that it has anything to do with our works and believe only in what he did. That's the only repentance necessary for salvation. Go to Acts chapter number 20. Go to Acts chapter 20. Yet there's so many doctrinal statements, even of Baptists today, that will pollute salvation with works today. They pollute salvation with works. They add a repentance of sin for salvation today, and it's garbage. It's false doctrine. It's heresy, and it's not getting anybody saved. Anybody that teaches this is teaching a false gospel. Now, what do they turn to? Well, there is no verse that says repent of your sins. Okay, so they can't turn to that verse. It's not like, well, yeah, you have to repent of your sins. It's like, which verse is that? The only English Bible I know of that has that phrase is the New Living Translation, which should be called like the New Luciferian Translation, really. It adds it in there tons of times. But you know what? That's a bad translation, and it's not what the Bible teaches. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 21. The Bible says, testifying both of the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. The Bible often restates things. So when it says repentance towards God, what's equivalent to that? Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's, he's defining repentance for you. He's defining what that repentance looks like or means specifically. If in Acts chapters, you know, 13 through all the way up to this point, every time they're preaching to the Gentiles, they're all worshiping false gods. They all have a false religion. What do you think they probably need to do to go ahead and believe on Jesus? Don't they have to stop believing in their false god? Stop believing in Diana? Stop believing in their false god, whatever it is? Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Hey, that's a carved stone, isn't it? Isn't it interesting that all the idols are carved stones? But what is the salvation? Oh, yeah, it's a whole stone. It's only what God created, isn't it? So you have to get rid of those carved stones and grab a whole stone. And here's the thing, just because you don't have in your church a, a picture of Diana, what if your little stone has repent of your sins written on it? It's just as garbage. It's just as wrong, and they have to repent of that stone and get rid of that stone and grab a whole stone. It's either a whole stone, you're either all saved or you're not saved. There's no percentage of, well, I'm kind of saved. No, you're just either saved or you're not. You either have the right repentance or you don't. And you say, well, what's the right repentance? Flip back and look at chapter 19, verse 4. He'll define for you what repentance is. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, sang unto the people that they should believe on him which had come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So notice what repentance even means. Believing on Jesus Christ in the context of salvation. Now, hey, the word repent can have multiple meanings. Just like the word go could have multiple definitions. I'm going to the store. I'm going to the bathroom, right? I mean, go is a, a word that just could be put in any kind of context and you could use it however you want. That's the word repent. But every time the word repent is used in relation to salvation, what is it? Stop trusting in whatever you're trusting to get you into heaven that's not Jesus and put it all in what Jesus did. That's all it is. Yet I've looked at a lot of doctrinal statements. This is what they say. Repentance is a persistent turning away from sin. I don't even say it's turning away, it's persistent. This is from a Baptist church. They say that faith is inseparably united with repentance. Now, here's the thing. Properly defined, I agree. But here's the thing. They define for you what repentance is. What was it? A persistent turning away from sin. 
That would be a what? Faith plus work salvation. Isn't that what everybody... That's what the Catholics believe. That's what every false religion believes. That it's just faith and towards God and living the best life that you can possibly live and God will finally get you in there. You ask the Hindu, that's how they get saved. You ask the Muslim, that's how they get saved. You ask the Catholic, that's how they get saved. You ask the Protestant, that's how you get saved. You ask Baptists today, that's what they say. It's sick. It's gross. They're polluting salvation with works today. Look, it has nothing to do with repenting of your sins. And we need preachers to be clear on this issue. Not more confusing. Not having a hewn stone altar and, and trying to get people to offer sacrifices on the wrong altar. Who cares about every other issue? Honestly. I mean, if you are going to a church with the wrong altar and they're trying to get you to put every sacrifice under the sun on that altar, that's going to profit you nothing. They should be thundering forth the right gospel message. And look, there's so many Baptist churches today that they have this kind of a doctrinal statement. They don't preach on salvation. And if you try to ask them, they get offended and they won't tell you. And it's like, what, what could be more important? Oh, we got a brother, we need to worry about more important things like tithing and, you know, church attendance and, you know, the COVID restrictions and what the government's doing, and blah, blah. Look, there's nothing more important than the gospel. If you can't give me a clear message on the gospel, bye. Why would I want to even listen to a preacher that's mixing up the gospel, not clear, not thundering it forth, not making it manifest? And look, their view of salvation is a very Calvinistic view when you think about it. A persistent turning away from sin is inseparable with your faith. And they say this is a grace wrought by the Holy Spirit. This, this inseparable, you know, uh, adding of grace, I'm sorry, of, of faith and repentance is this grace wrought by the Holy Spirit. But, but here's the thing. Their view of salvation, let me give you my parable, okay, is like riding on a carnival cruise ship. And then singing this song, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Here's the thing. From a Calvinistic viewpoint, you didn't choose to believe. You didn't choose to do the works. It's just all automatic. Just like you getting on that cruise ship, you're not going to do anything to determine where it goes. I mean, that ship's going where you're just along for the ride. Whereas the Bible is like you with a canoe and a paddle. And then it's singing, row, row, row. You're, it's like you either go or nothing happens. And here's the reality. You get saved, and after you get saved, you have the choice to either row or not. Your works are not automatic. You persistently turning away from sin, you have to be like, all right, not going to sin, not going to sin today, and not going to sin today. You're not just on this carnival cruise ship just like, woo! I'm not sin. Praise the Lord! I just gave up every sin automatically. The Lord saved me, you know. These guys are fake. They're phony. The Lord saved me from drugs, and he saved me from alcohol, and he saved me from this, and he saved me from that. Look, those guys are just getting on putting up a show, a vain show. They're just like on the little carnival cruise, you know, saying like, woo. But how does that even make sense when the Bible's constantly instructing you to row your boat? It's constantly telling you to give up sin and die daily and crucify the flesh. Like, if it's so automatic, then why do I have so many commandments telling me it's not automatic? That doesn't make very much sense. Why are you giving me, you know, all these instructions on how to go down the stream if I don't even need them? If I don't even have a choice. Now, when it comes to this issue, we should never compromise on this issue. And yet there's a lot of Baptists today that are going to compromise on this issue. And you say, how could a church like us compromise on this issue? I'll tell you exactly how they did it. Friends. Friends. Baptist churches want to be friends with another Baptist. And guess what this Baptist does? He pollutes salvation with works. So they'll get up and they'll say, well, I know that this preacher gets up and says that salvation's repenting of your sins, but he doesn't really mean it. I wish I had a nickel for every time someone told me they don't really mean what they say. I'd have enough to buy a two by four by now.
What's the point of getting up and preaching things that you don't mean? Go to Matthew chapter 12. What, what if I sat up here and I built an altar that's all hewn stone, and I'm like, this is the type of altar that you need, and then someone comes up and they're like, well, that's not going to do it. God's not going to be pleased with that. Well, that's not what I meant. It's like, it's not, it's not unclear. It's either you don't grave it or you do. Like what? People that are getting up and saying, oh, you have to repent of your sins to be saved are lying. They're teaching false doctrine. They should be called out. You should separate from these people. You should have nothing to do. But what are they? What, Baptists, they don't want to separate from these people. They don't want to distinguish themselves from these people. So what do they do? They compromise and they say, oh, well, I know he says that, teaches it, and explains it, but that's not what he meant. What? Why, why would I get up and try to show you a, a, a brick that I've carved and say, this is salvation, but I don't really mean it. Just grab one and don't do anything to it. That doesn't even make sense. How could it make sense? The most important doctrine, I'm confusing. I'm polluting. I'm, look, then why are you a preacher? What's the point? Well, I get up and I teach all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, but if you're putting all kinds of sacrifices on the wrong altar, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. If you have the wrong foundation, imagine we're going to go ahead and build the most beautiful house on the sand today. Who cares? Because the, the ocean's just going to come and knock it all down. But did you see the curtains that we put in there? Did you see all the beautiful marble and the tile? And Who cares? It's going to get knocked down. You either have the right foundation or nothing. And these preachers that are getting up and, and being a compromiser and saying, well, yeah, you're attacking good men that are preaching work salvation. Well, they don't wear it that way. You're attacking good men that are confused on repentance. Well, then you're not good. How could you say he's good? How could you say that that's good preaching? How could you say, well, but he puts really good sacrifices on the wrong altar. I, have you heard this sermon that's not about salvation? That he preaches is really good. Yeah, well, what does he teach on salvation? Well, I know it's wrong, but then get away from that person. Have nothing to do with that person. Don't compromise. Why do they, why do they want to be friends with this person? Because it's political. And let me tell you what, independent fundamental Baptist churches are political today. You say, what, Republican? No, I'm saying within themselves. All, they're all buddies of a certain Bible college. They're all buddies with a certain area. They want to have, be in, invited to certain conferences. They want to have certain guest preachers come to their church. They want to rub shoulders with the right guys. They want to get recognition. They want to have notoriety. They don't want to have to separate from people. They don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't want people to get mad at them. So they compromise on this issue. Why would you compromise on salvation? Why would you get up and rub shoulders with somebody that's teaching a works-based salvation? You're a compromiser. It's wicked. It makes no sense. Now, hey, maybe there's someone that uses the wrong terminology, and I'm not going to throw them in hell, but they're a bad preacher, period. Don't get up to me and defend me, somebody that's preaching work salvation, and say, this guy is a great preacher, though. Yeah, but he doesn't really mean it when he teaches work salvation. I don't care if he means it or not. Does, what does the Bible say? Because does it really matter what I think? No. It only matters what the Bible says. Okay. So let's ask this question. If I teach something wrong, but I don't mean it, does it matter? Okay, well, let's ask. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. A good man and the good treasure of the heart bringing forth good things, and an evil man of the evil treasure bringing forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, let me ask this question. Does it say, by what you meant, you shall be justified? And by what you meant, you shall be condemned? Or does it say the words? It's the words. And here's the thing. It's sick how many preachers get up and preach lies and heresy and they can say, well, that's not what I meant. And people are like, oh, okay, no problem then. Yeah, well, what did you mean? Whatever you want me to mean. <laughs> I know I taught repent of your sins and that if you're not living a righteous life, then you're not saved. But what I meant by that is it's all by grace. What? 
Look, I've visited other Baptist churches and I've talked to their assistant pastors and other, and this one assistant pastor told me he got up in front of his church and he said, if you don't have works, you're not saved. And he was acting like he was real tough and big and I'm just thinking like, I want to stay away from you. <laughs> like, I just want to, before the lightning bolt strikes. <laughs> Yet, I know all, the, all kinds of other Baptists that fall all over themselves to be friends with these people because they're popular, because they have a big YouTube channel, because they have a following, because they're so much more gracious and loving. I'm not going to be gracious towards a work's salvation. I'm not going to be loving. Well, you're mean about it. Good. I would hate it for someone to say, you're really nice to people that teach a work salvation. I hope they say you're the meanest person about it. You're ugly about it. You call people out about it. You make everyone uncomfortable about it. Great! Because the whole world's going to die and go to hell. Because people are compromising on this issue. Because people are not making it clear on this issue. In fact, the majority of the people that we reach or people that come to a church like ours, they were confused on this for a while. They don't want someone to get up and kowtow and, and be vague or not saying what they mean or getting up and just, well, uh, you know, some people believe in repenting your sins, whatever, you know, it's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. Get rid of your stupid doctrinal statement. Well, I don't think it's fair that people should be able to call me and ask me what I believe. Aren't you a preacher? What? What profession are you in? This is like, you know, all the states, wherever uh, they're doing these elect election audits, and they're like, you don't have any right to audit us. And it's like, well, what are you hiding? <laughs> why would you not be able to audit? Why, I mean, why would you not want to be able to check these things and ask these things? Look, you know, I don't get mad at somebody asking me what I believe. I want the whole world to hear what I have to say. Amen. Especially on salvation. Why would I think, like, someone's calling me and they want to know about salvation. I don't want to have to tell them that. I thought it was I love to tell the story. How hard is it for you to declare his righteousness? Is that really difficult for you to say? You get really offended when you have to tell people about Jesus Christ, right? Think about it. These preachers, they're, I'm so offended somebody wants to know what I believe about salvation. Is it because you teach a work salvation? Because if you don't, why are you so offended? Why, why can't you just tell us what you believe? Here's the thing. There's people that just make it clear where they stand, and then there's vague people, okay? All the vague people are trash. And the people that are clear and wrong, they're trash. You know what's good? The people that are clear and right. That's it. Why would I want to be here? And look, riddle me this. Let's find all these people that don't believe wrong on salvation, but they do teach it wrong. Like they're, pre they're, they're polluting it with repent of your sins, but they somehow believe it right in their heart. Show me all their fruit. Show me all the people that they got saved that are fired up, serving the Lord, doing great things. Because what I notice is they're not doing great things. What I notice is that basically they're just riding on the coattails of whoever it was that gave them a church or whatever Bible college they're, they're riding the coattails of. And these people that are friends that end up befriending these heretics and these false preachers, they also don't have good fruit either. Because when you start compromising on this issue, you're not going to be making waves and changing the world. Look, who's really getting lots of people saved? The people that are super clear, unapologetic, really mean about it. Those are the people that are getting lots of people saved that have lots of fruit. Look, why would I want to sit here and compromise just to be friends with a certain person? Friendship, that's being a respect of persons. I'm not interested in that kind of person. And notice, I'm basically aligning myself potentially with lots of false prophets that can literally say a work salvation, I'm not going to separate from that person. Just skip back a few verses. Verse 33, either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Well, why do you want to pick on this guy for, for preaching false doctrine? Well, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or make it corrupt. What's the point in being, well, I kind of have some corrupt uh, fruit, but I'm a good tree? What? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know what? You're never going to catch me accidentally preaching work salvation. 
I'm not going to, you know, I can stumble over my words. I could call David Daniel and Daniel David. I could mix up a name. I could mix up a place. But I'm not going to be like accidentally just like, oh, and by the way, if you don't have works, then you're not going to heaven and you can lose your salvation and the Bible's not real. Oh, I was so nervous up here that I just started preaching heresy. (laughs) It's like, what? That's what people act like. They're like, well, when you get up there and there's all these people in front of you. you When you get really nervous, you know it starts coming out, what's ever really in your heart. Look, when you start getting under pressure, that's why cops put people under pressure and they bring all they bring all the pressure and the heat and they're making you nervous because they know the truth will eke out. The truth ekes out when you get up and start preaching. And when you can't ever eke out the right gospel, it's not there. It's funny when you I, I look at preachers and I can tell everything that they believe by what I can't find. When I can't find salvation by faith, I can't find a sermon. Look. Go look at a preacher. Go find a preacher that you have respect for, that you're not sure where he stands, and find me any sermon where he's preaching clearly on salvation. You're like, well, I can't find one. It's because he's wrong. (laughs) How could you be saved and there's no no gospel presentation, there's no sermon about it, you're just never preaching the right gospel? Well, the few times he did, he taught something wrong. That's because he's wrong. Why would I want to compromise with these people? Here's, the, here's why they want to compromise them. Because they have a beautiful altar. Have you seen that guy's pulpit? Have you seen that guy's church? It's so beautiful. And that pulpit, I mean, it just looks like it came down from heaven. And it's all carved all nice. Yeah, but what is he preaching from behind that pulpit? And people just want to go preach for that guy or be that guy's buddy or be that guy's friend. Look, I'm not interested in being friends with compromisers on this issue. You say, well, is that going to cost you friends? I hope so. I don't want to be friends. Anybody that wants to compromise on this issue, just stop being my friend immediately. And you say, well, are you going to call people out for preaching this? I hope so. I hope I have enough courage to call people out if they start compromising and getting weak on this doctrine and weak on this issue. And what is it going to benefit you if I start befriending people that teach repent of your sins but don't mean it? That's just going to make you more weak, you more watered down, you more compromised. It's not going to get anybody saved. It's sick. It's gross. It's disgusting. And what do these compromises and heretics do? Instead of producing good fruit, they just choke someone else's. You know, there's a lot of people that are quote unquote new IFB these days, but I know there's a lot of them are compromisers. And you say, which ones? Well, I don't know. They change every week. But you know what I notice about these compromisers? You know what I know about these people that get so offended at calling out somebody who preaches repent of your sins? They don't have any fruit of their own. They're just choking the fruit that was given to them. They have all this fruit from somebody like Pastor Anderson or Pastor Jimenez that are coming into their church that are doing a lot of great works, but they haven't produced any fruit. All they're doing is just choking all the fruit that's in that church by being a compromiser. And why... Of all the people to defend on this planet today, why am I going to go fall backwards defending people that are preaching a false gospel? Preaching a works-based salvation. That doesn't even make any sense. Isn't the most important thing getting people saved? Don't we go out and preach the gospel just day after day, week after week, just every... We have so many times all the time where we're going out and trying to make it clear. And who are we fighting against? We're fighting against all the preachers that have been lying to these people and telling them the exact opposite. How could I then say that this guy's my friend when he's literally producing people that I'm going to have to go out and reteach the gospel to? He's not my friend. If you're against me, you're not with me. You're either on my team or you're not. Hey, I, I, I don't remember in the Bible where uh, Moses drew a line in the sand and said, well, some people are standing on the wrong side, but that's not where they really want to stand. They didn't mean to stand over there. No, it's like, get on the right side or die. Well, that's mean. (laughs) Look, he's killing the heretics. I haven't killed a single heretic yet, okay? Start calling me mean when I start killing heretics, okay? Well, you preached against them. Oh, Oh, no, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words hurt way worse. Yeah, but good people leave my church whenever you preach against me. Great. Isn't that wonderful? 
all the heretics stay with you and all the good people leave. Look, we should never stop calling people out for this. And, and look, if my church member calls somebody out for that, I'm not going to be like, why are you attacking great men of God for calling out this guy believing a wrong gospel, for believing a false gospel? And like, well, whose job is it? Is that your job? Well, you know, the Apostle Paul didn't cease to warn night and day. And guess what? He wasn't a pastor. Well, you're not a pastor. You don't get to do it. Should I have said that to Paul? Acts chapter 20. He's like, I cease not to warn night and day. Well, you're not a pastor, Paul, so you don't get to do it. You don't get to warn about anybody. Look, I hope you warn everybody about every false prophet that ever exists. And even if they're saved and mixed up, warn about them. Why would I want to hang out with somebody that's saved and mixed up either? I don't, I'm, we're, we're supposed to be separated from the world. We're supposed to be different. We're independent. 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 I'm independent of any work salvation, of any false gospel. Don't ask me to compromise. Don't expect me to compromise. And if you want me to be friends with any of these compromisers, just leave now before you get your feelings hurt. All right? Let's go in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for... Uh, giving us such an easy gospel, just a free gospel, something that's so simple, so easy. I pray that we wouldn't just corrupt the gospel. We know there's many which corrupt the gospel. And and the Bible says that we're not supposed to tolerate it even for an hour. And and I think today people are just so interested in being friends with everybody and just uh, they care about what men think and they care about being friends with the world. But I pray that we just care about being friends with you. And we know that setting up the wrong altar is going to destroy people's lives. They're going to go to hell if they don't have that right altar, which is Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would not corrupt the gospel. We would, we would be excited to declare his righteousness and what he's done, and that we would never be a compromising church, but rather we would stand firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.